Thank you. Well, it's a tremendous honor for me to be with you today. I do want to make mention of a DVD, Islamic Conquest Past and Present. It's five half-hour TV shows that I've recorded on this subject. And then a book, What Every American Needs to Know About the Quran, A History of Islam and the United States. And I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of that. So what's happening right now? Well, past behavior is the best indicator of future performance. You're going to invest in a stock? Well, how did it do last week? Well, what are we going to do with the situation with Islamic immigration? We look at the past. Uh, there's 1,400 years of track record that we can look at, so there's really no mystery. And this is the world 20 years before Muhammad was born. This is the Byzantine Christian Empire, and uh, it is being overrun by the Persian Empire. So these were the two superpowers. This is the U.S. versus the USSR during the Cold War, the East versus the West. Muhammad's 40 years old in 610. Now, Muhammad's father died before he was born. His mother died when he was six years old. His grandfather and guardian died when he was eight years old. So he was orphaned and taken in by an uncle named Abu Talib, who was a merchant, and take Muhammad on camel rides. So Muhammad would go to different cities and hear about the different religions. Um, and the pagan religion, the Zoroaster, and the Christian and Jewish. And Anyway, he marries a rich widow, and uh, he's 25 years old, and she's 40. When she dies, um, then he uh, marries anywhere from 11 to 22 wives. But in 610 AD, Muhammad's in a cave and a spirit appeared to him and uh, he began his faith. And so for 12 years, he only made 70 converts. 12 years, only 70 converts. That's nothing really outstanding. Uh, He's a little frustrated that fewer are joining. And so he gets a little frustrated, a little pushy, a little argumentative, a little confrontational and threatening. And so the Jews chase him out of town. I mean, the, the, the pagans chase him out of town in the year 622 AD. And Muhammad flees north to the Jewish city called Medina. And the uh, Jews are nice enough to let him in as an immigrant. He's a religious refugee. He comes into this Jewish town as an immigrant. He presents his faith. They reject it. And so he goes into the minority neighborhoods in Medina and begins to make some converts. A few of these minority converts um, uh, resist him, and they mysteriously get assassinated. But the rest of these pagans in the minority neighborhoods follow Muhammad. And now he's a political leader. He goes back to the Jews and makes a treaty with them. And so now he's a religious leader and he's a political leader. Then something happens to his followers back in Mecca. They get a little pushy, argumentative, and threatening, the way some of his followers do today. They get chased out of town. They flee north to Medina, where Muhammad's now a political leader. And Muhammad permits them to rob the caravans headed to Mecca in retaliation for the Meccans chasing them out of town. So it's a little different than Jesus who said, if they take your coat, give them your shirt. Muhammad said, if they take your caravan, uh, your, your house, you take their caravan. So Muhammad had 300 warriors, and they would rob the caravans. And so um, uh, in the year 624 AD, the Meccans send 1,000 soldiers to protect their caravan, and Muhammad with 300 defeats 1,000 at the Battle of Badra. And Muhammad takes this amazing victory as confirmation that his Allah wants him to be a military leader. And he fights in 66 battles and raids in the next eight years before he dies. He leads 27 of them. He even used the catapult when he attacked the city of Al-Taif. And when he was told the catapult was killing innocent women and children, Muhammad's response was, they are among them. So they got to be killed too. So suicide bombers today say it's okay to kill innocent people to advance Islam because Muhammad did when he used the catapult. So... We see these three stages that he went through, religious, political, and military. And uh, then this idea of victimhood. And so here, if you gather the scenario, he's in Mecca, and he's hanging around that Kaaba where all the pagans worship, and he's insulting them, telling them that they're going to burn in hell. And when they finally chase him out, he says, I'm the victim. You are intolerant of me. Therefore, I'm justified in attacking your caravans. This is a concept that are being used by Muslims groups today. They'll come in and they'll be, one, they'll be pushy, pushy, pushy. And if you finally stand up to them, that's when they say, we're the victims. You're intolerant of us. And uh, anyway, so RPM, like your car, religious, political, military. So in the year 627 AD, he's out at Mecca now for five years. Uh, the people of Mecca decide that they're going to send 10,000 soldiers to Medina to stop Muhammad from robbing their caravans, their last-ditch effort. Lo and behold, Muhammad turns out to be a brilliant military leader. I actually spoke on a military base, and uh, the officers were amazed. They said, we've only been taught not to offend them. Nobody teaches us the battles Muhammad fought in. Muhammad was very creative, unconventional, asymmetrical warfare, so to speak. In other words, he didn't play by the rules. Uh, There was one month off where all the pagans agreed not to fight. And Muhammad gets verses from his Allah to rob the caravans during this 
Ramadan pilgrimage month, he captures them totally by surprise. Well, Muhammad's version of roadside bombs and IEDs is when the Meccans send their 10,000 soldiers, he digs potholes and trenches all around the city of Medina, which renders the superior cavalry of the Meccans useless. You can't charge your horse and camel across a field full of potholes and trenches, they'll break their legs. Throws off the whole battle strategy. Uh, Muhammad bribes some of the tribes and they slip away in the night. He threatens some of the other tribes and they slip away in the night. Sort of the Chicago politics, the bribe or the bullet. And then it gets freezing cold for a week. The Meccans lose heart and decide to bring their troops home. And when the Meccans retreat and bring their troops home, Muhammad considered this a great victory, that his enemies were cowards and they could not subdue him. And so now he's emboldened and he goes back into that city of Medina. Remember those three Jewish tribes that let him in five years earlier? He go, gets offended at two of the tribes, confiscates their property and chases them out of town. This is actually a concept in Islam called hudna. When you're weak, you make treaties until you get strong enough to disregard them. Right? Anyway, the third Jewish tribe in Medina, he bottles them in their neighborhood for 25 days. When they finally surrender, he brings them into the market and chops off the heads of the men, six or seven hundred, and then sells the women and children into slavery. Slavery was the number one way that Islam was financed for 1,400 years. And um, they enslaved 180 million Africans and uh, castrate the men, make them eunuchs, but they enslaved over a, over a million Europeans. There were entire Catholic orders in Europe called the Trinitarians. The head of the order was the Ransomer, and they would go under a white flag to North Africa to try to get back your friend that never showed up from his boat ride or was taken from a Greek or a, a village, you know, or an Italian coast or from Spain or Portugal. But the um, idea is five years within Mohammed immigrating to the Jewish city of Medina, there's not a Jew left in the city of Medina. <laughs> and so we see that, uh, that he had this uh, pattern. Uh, and so Caesar's three steps was vini, vidi, vici. I came, I saw, I conquered. Muhammad's three steps was he immigrated, he increased, he eliminated. He immigrated as a religious leader, and they were nice enough to let him in. Then he increased the number of his followers amongst the disadvantaged minorities. And when he gets a following, he turns into a political leader. And then he eliminates the previous culture. This is going on right now. We see it happening in Europe. Europe's very socialist. The government pays for their health care, welfare, and retirement, but they're having fewer kids plus abortion. So who's going to pay all the taxes to support all these social programs? They decide that immigrants will. So they open the door. 70% of immigrants into Europe are Muslim, 50 million of them, and they're having, on the average, eight kids per family. And they are taking over neighborhoods. So in 20 years, there'll be 100 million Muslims in Europe. And guess what? They'll dominate the politics. So Europe has gone from drive in the neutral, and now it's going into reverse. What do I mean? Well, ideologically, Europe used to be Catholic, and then the Protestant Reformation, and always had a remnant of Jews. They didn't always live up to it, but they had this idea of you're all equal in the eyes of a creator and do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, then Europe begins to transition to secular with the French Revolution. Uh, Voltaire was sort of like the John Stewart of the day. He was mocking religion. And then uh, Robespierre put the prostitute in Notre Dame Cathedral, covered her with a sheet, and said, this is the goddess of reason. Let's worship her. And then Napoleon spreads this French infidelity, this secularism all around Europe. And so secularism is sort of, um, oh, like Roundup. You spray it on your lawn and it kills everything. But does your lawn stay that way? Well, no. We see something happen. Immigrants come into Europe with lots of different beliefs. A lot of them get along, but then Sharia Muslims come in and they take over neighborhoods and they call Jews apes and pigs and you can beat your wife and you can honor kill your daughter and the Europeans are scratching their heads saying, how did we get here? You go from Judeo-Christian to secular, now it's becoming Islamic. And uh, matter of fact, uh, in, in China, they had to get rid of uh, 5,000 years of Chinese culture before they could become the People's Republic of China. So it's this co concept in communism called deconstruction. You know, you have to unhook the train car from one engine before you hook it on another. You have to unhook a people from their past, their traditions, their culture, before you can take them into this new direction. China's case was communism. Europe's case is Islam. But it's sort of interesting. 751 no-go zones in Paris. They're called zonas urbanas and sensibles, sensitive urban zones. Five million Muslims move in. How did they take over these neighborhoods? Immigrate, increase, eliminate. The first ones come in as immigrants, and they're nice. People say, I met a Muslim. They're nice. Let more in. More come in, they get a community. They get an imam. He teaches them to follow the Quran closer. Ladies start wearing the burqas, build the um, mosque, and begin to block streets during times of prayer. And people can't go out of their stores and so forth. And so they uh, end up taking over these neighborhoods. And lo and behold, they're finding out the number one group in all Western Europeans countries signing up for welfare are Muslim immigrants. 
And the guy will have four wives, put them all on welfare. He'll have 17 kids. He'll be living like a king while he's Islamifying. So the Europeans are actually paying to have themselves changed. Uh, these are neighborhoods around Paris, Marseille, uh, Toulouse, and um, Britain. Twelve cities around London are uh, targeted to be uh, Islamic emirates. Birmingham, Liverpool, Manchester, look at all this. And Muhammad's the number one name given to newborns in London. Uh, it's culturally a stigma for a Muslim woman to have less than five children. Anyway, Brussels, Belgium is now 20% Muslim. Mohammed's the number one name given to newborns. Several neighborhoods have become no-go zones. Police um, are pelted with stones when they answer a call. So they have to send in two police cars, uh, one to protect the other policeman. Anyway, Germany, 10 years ago there were three mosques. Today they're building 200. Even the police commissioner uh, reported that... Um, Turkish Muslim immigrants are imposing no-go zones at an alarming rate. And Angela Merkel, just last year, the president of Germany, said multiculturalism has failed. You should not immigrate here unless you're going to learn our German language and embrace our Christian ethic. That's what she said. Italy. In Rome, Muslims are commandeering the Piazza Venezia for public prayers. In uh, Bologna, uh, Muslims threaten to bomb a church. In um, Netherlands, there are 40 no-go zones in Holland. Uh, most of southern Holland is Moroccan Muslim. I mean, look at all these neighborhoods. And uh, Sweden, Malmo is now 25% 20 Muslim, and they have no-go zones. Fire and emergency workers refuse to enter these Muslim districts. Why? Because they get attacked if they go in there. And the number one crime in Norway, Sweden, and Denmark is rape. Muslim immigrant men raping European women. Why? Mohammed permitted his men to rape the women they took in battle. And so there are these blonde-haired Swedish girls dyeing their hair black because they're afraid they're going to be targeted. Um, so it's a brilliant strategy. You take advantage of the freedom of religion and then to organize, and then you take over politically. Um, so it's a brilliant strategy. You take advantage of the freedom of religion and then to organize, and then you take over politically. And so this is the, the big elephant in the room. There's freedom for all religions in America, but Islam's not just a religion. It's a political system and a military system. Why? Because Muhammad was not just a religious leader. He was a political leader and a military leader. And so uh, this is one of the newscast signs carried by a Muslim in Detroit, Michigan. We will use the freedoms of the Constitution to destroy the Constitution. And uh, Dwight Eisenhower faced this in the 1950s. Why? Communists took over 45 countries. And the way the communists did it is they would send community organizers into countries to organize the poor to overthrow the rich. And once there was blood in the streets, they would set up dictatorships. Stalin, Pol Pot, Ho Chi Minh, Castro, Mao Tse Tung. And as these communist community organizers and labor organizers came into America, uh, uh, Time Magazine, Dwight Eisenhower says the Bill of Rights contains no grant of privilege for a group of people to destroy the Bill of Rights. A group dedicated to the ultimate destruction of all civil liberties cannot be allowed to claim civil liberties as its privileged sanctuary from which to carry on subversion of the government. So they couldn't come in and wave a flag and say, freedom of speech and oppress an assembly. We want to organize to overthrow the government where we're not going to allow freedom of press or assembly. And so you can't say, hey, we want to build a ground zero mosque, but the goal is to have a form of government that does not allow other religions. Right? I love it when these Muslim commentators get on TV and want to lecture us about our First Amendment, where in their countries there is none. Right? It is the death penalty in Saudi Arabia to leave Islam. Anyway, so again, within five years of Muhammad's death, every pre-existing culture in Arabia was eliminated. Do you know Yemen was a Jewish kingdom for centuries? Do you know there were Ghassanids who were Arab Christians? Today it sort of seems like an oxymoron, but they were, they were all wiped out by Muhammad. And so there's three waves of Islamic immigration and expansion. The one is the Arabic and Persian wave, uh, 622 to, to 1071. Then a Turkish wave, and now we're beginning to see an Arab spring wave. Uh, interesting military invention the Muslims got before the Europeans called the stirrup. Invented by the Mongolian nomads over by China. Uh, it went to the Persians, and then the Muslims got them. And then the Muslims had these swords called scimitars, made of Damascus steel. And this was like the AK-47, and they would ride on horseback like F-16s, and they literally could slice somebody in half while riding at a full gallop. And they were unstoppable. By the way, this is a marble freeze just down the street of the Supreme Court chamber. 18 lawgivers through history. does have Moses and his Ten Commandments and Charlemagne. And, but it has this guy, Muhammad, with his Arabic crown, his beard, his, and his scimitar sword. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is Muhammad's sword. It still exists in Istanbul in a mosque. And um, we see the um, interesting verse, Warfare is ordained for you, though it is hateful unto you. You know, but it may happen that you hate a thing that's good for you, and it may happen you love a thing which is bad for you. Allah knoweth, and you knoweth not. Fighting's prescribed for you, fighting's enjoined on you. So it's not that they want to kill, 
Matter of fact, while they're killing, they think, I don't like doing this. I hate doing this. That's, by the way, a thing called your conscience. But uh, this verse gets around that by saying that, oh, I feel bad whenever I kill somebody, but you're going to read it. Uh, Allah knoweth and you knoweth not. Do it anyway. Anyway, so Muhammad would go to people and say, look, if you follow me, your debts will be canceled. If you're a slave, you'll be free. And you get booty, which is women. And if you die, you get lots of women. And so this is a unique cocktail of human motivations that uh, most religions say are, are a fallen part of your nature that you need to resist, but Muhammad harnessed this. Here's a verse in the Quran. Surah 33, Prophet, we have made lawful to you the slave girls who Allah has given you as booty. Marry women of your choice, two, three, or four. I think it's interesting, it doesn't even give you the option of one. Uh, plus, you can have as many as your right hand possesses, as many as you take in battle. Women can be married for religion, fortune, beauty, marry one for religion. Why is this important? Uh, they're taking over neighborhoods in America, and they're having lots of wives signing up for welfare. I did a radio interview in um, Vera Beach, Florida, and the guest host was a lady who was um, Katie Anderson in the old TV series Father Knows Best. Remember that? And uh, she's lived, she's, um, you know, in her uh, early 70s in an uh, uh, apartment complex in Orlando. And she said that um, uh, some Muslims began to move in. And uh, after a few years, a Muslim lady came to her door and says, I want to invite you to marry my husband. <laughs> and she says, uh, you're married to your husband. And she says, oh, he's Muslim. He could have more than one wife. And she says, well, I'm a Christian. I'm sorry. He goes, oh, it's okay for him to have a Christian woman as one of his wives. And she goes, no, really, I'm not interested. And she said a few months later, the guy comes to her door with a teacup and a saucer and tries to push his way in and have her serve him tea. She said, I knew enough of the Islamic culture that if a woman fills the role of a traditional wife, he can claim her as a wife. So she said, you're not going to come into my house. And a few weeks later, he saw the man with a little girl and said, oh, is this your daughter? He says, no, this is my new wife. It's in Orlando. And the same type of thing happened in Detroit, Michigan. Anyway, here's Muhammad said, the person who participates in holy battles in Allah's cause, nothing compels him to do so except belief in Allah and his apostle, will be recompensed by Allah either by a reward or booty if he survives or will be admitted to paradise if he is killed. This is the one verse in all of Islam that promises paradise, and it has that booty motivation. Uh, Anas said, the prophet used to visit all his wives at an hour round during the day. At night, they were 11 in number. I asked Anas, had the prophet strength for it? Anas replied, we used to say the prophet was given the strength of 30 men. Now, why is this important? Because when Muslims immigrate to neighborhoods in America, they want to enact Sharia law. Most of Sharia law deals with women. And uh, Muhammad had a brand new wife, Mary. She was a Coptic Christian he had captured. He was with her in another wife's bedroom because he had a special room and a special night with each wife. Um, the old wife walks in gets all upset and organizes the harem to not sleep with Muhammad. And uh, when word gets around town, he's having trouble at home. He gets this verse, O consorts of the prophet, if any of you were guilty of evident unseemly conduct, the punishment will be doubled for her, and that's easy for Allah. After that, the wives cried and repented, and, and um, they didn't complain. Uh, then he visits his adopted son named Zaid, sees his pretty wife Zanadab, and um, anyway, he ends up forcing Zaid to divorce her so he can marry her. And uh, then he has a dream two nights in a row of him marrying a six-year-old girl. The prophet engaged me when I was a girl of six. Later, my mother, Umraman, came to me while I was playing in a swing with some of my girlfriends. She took some water around my face. Some women said, Allah's blessings and good luck. Allah's apostle came to me in the forenoon. My mother handed me over to him. At that time, I was a girl of nine years of age. Now, she was very important in the development of Sharia law. Uh, one time, Muhammad was going on a raid, and she, he brought her along, a uh, caravan going across the desert. Well, she has to use the restroom. She slips off the camel without telling anybody, you know, where they had a canopy on it. Uh, when she comes over the sand dune, they're gone. And so a guy... A um, straggler on a donkey picks her up, takes her back to Muhammad. And uh, the Muslim men said, he must have raped her in the desert. And the little girl said, he didn't rape me. So Muhammad made a decision. He said, there has to be four witnesses. Otherwise, a rape never happened. That became law in Islam. That's part of Sharia law. But you add to that that Sharia law says it takes two women to testify against one man which means you'd need eight women to testify they saw the rape, otherwise it never happened. Then you add to that that a kafir infidel or Jew or a Christian cannot testify in Sharia law courts against the Muslim. They have no standing. Then you add to that that even if they can prove the woman was raped, it's the woman that gets whipped a hundred times for allowing herself to be used as a tool of Satan to tempt the man. That's why the women wear the burqas to look unattractive on purpose. That's why earlier this year in Pakistan, a 40-year-old man raped his 14-year-old niece. When the police found out about it, they came to the house and arrested the niece. And she was whipped 100 times. She died after the 80th whip. This is Sharia law. It's going on in, in places in America today. And immigrants to America, like in Dearborn, Michigan, and Florida, these different places, they are wanting to practice, and they are practicing it um, there. 
Anyway, I could go on and talk more about his wives, but we're going to go on. So a bunch of Muslims would leave. Muhammad said, you can't. Those are the riddle laws. Uh, there was Khalif Abu Bakr, Khalif Umar, uh, General Khalid Ibn al-Walid. This guy was undefeated in 100 battles. And um, anyway, this is all in my DVD. Muhammad conquered this dark tan area. Then Khalif Umar conquered Egypt, which had been Coptic Christian for six centuries. Uh, conquered Jerusalem, which had been Byzantine Christian for three centuries. Conquered Syria, which was the first country to completely be Christian. Um, and uh, anyway, by the way, you're, you're rebuilding this mosque. Did you know this? This Amir Ibn Alas mosque. Hillary Clinton's U.S. ambassadors aid uh, 770 million U.S. taxpayer dollars of rebuilding mosques in 27 countries as an outreach to them, you know. Um, anyway, uh, so this is the, um, uh, the first wave of Islamic expansion. Look at this. This was within 25 years of Muhammad's death. They conquer Arabia. They conquer uh, the Holy Land. They conquer Egypt. They conquer Syria, uh, Persia, uh, toward Afghanistan, Armenia. And then there used to be 250 Catholic dioceses along North Africa in the 7th century, all conquered by Muhammad, Muhammad's rightly guided caliphs. This was the largest empire in the world, the Umayyad Muslim Empire. It went from the Persian Gulf to the Atlantic Ocean. And then they invade Spain. There were two, several Visigothic Christian kingdoms in Spain, and one of them had the bright idea to bring the Muslims over to help their side. Sort of like Republicans and Democrats and, hey, this new group of immigrants they're coming to the country, we want to get these immigrants into our party, right? Because they got a lot of maybe oil money or something. Well, the one group brings them across and the Muslims decide, hey, while we're here, we'll just conquer the whole thing. In 10 years, they conquered all of Spain. Why? Europeans were so on foot. Muslims were on horseback with their scimitar swords. They crossed the Pyrenees Mountains. They conquered southern France. They were finally stopped outside of Paris at the Battle of Tours in 732 A.D., exactly 100 years after the death of Muhammad in 632 A.D., right? Uh, it was Pope Gregory that put out a plea. Anybody that could fight should join Charles Martel. He gets about 30,000 guys, put them in a square on top of a hill, and uh, when the Muslims charge into it, they get stuck, and then he had some of his spies let go of the booty, and, and when the uh, commander was distracted, they killed him. So uh, they captured uh, Sicily, Corsica, Sardinia, uh, then I met Charlton Heston. He endorsed me when I ran for Congress. But uh, he was El Cid he, in that movie. El Cid was part of the Reconquista. It took 700 years to drive the Muslims out of Spain. And um, anyway, then they had the slavery. Like I mentioned, <clears throat> 180 million Africans. Heartbreaking stories. About a third of the tribe would be killed. Uh, but they had slavery in the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th century before the Europeans even discovered America. And then when a lot of the native Indians died and some of the Spanish and Portuguese decided to repopulate the Caribbean islands, they brought over slaves from Africa. But every slave brought to America was purchased at a Muslim slave market. And um, anyway, again, sad stories. Here's the Zanzibar coast, which is the Arab slave trading post. And they still have slavery today. Matter of fact, there's more slavery today than at any other time in world history. Uh, it's called human trafficking, and a whole lot of it is in Muslim countries. And um, then we see them attacking Constantinople. That was the New York City. That was the, uh, Washington, D.C. It was the capital of the world. Constantine moved the capital of Rome there where the Black Sea is in the Mediterranean. They attack, and this time they're defeated because the defenders had a military advantage called Greek fire. Took oil and sawdust, mixed it in these brass containers, and sprayed it with a torch in front. Like a, it went like napalm on the Muslim ships. And so this um, stopped the Muslim advance. And so the Muslims said, well, if they're going to conquer Europe, it just may have to wait till later. And so we see the word Islam means submission, submission to the will of Allah. A Muslim is one who has submitted to the will of Allah. And they think there will be world peace when the whole world submits to the will of Allah. So we think peace is different groups getting along. Faithful Muslims think there will be world peace when there's world Islam. So, so just a little, it's a religion of peace, just a different definition of the word peace, right? Um, there's two houses, the house of Islam, the house of war. So the non-Muslim world is supposed to be at war. And what about moderate Muslims? There are lots of moderate Muslims. Moderate Muslims believe the world will submit to Allah later. Maybe at the end of the world, maybe it's figurative and says it's so far in the distant future, just get along with the kafir infidel, have your family, and live your life. The fundamental Muslim thinks the world's going to submit it to Allah now, and they're really excited. They want to help make it happen. Now, the dilemma for the West is the more we bend over backwards in unprecedented ways to show ourselves tolerant, the more the moderate Muslim begins to rethink and say maybe the world is submitting now rather than later. And so uh, when we see, um, uh, but what about the Crusades? So now we're going to begin the second wave of Islamic immigration and expansion, the Turkish Right? Um, the Seljuk Turks and the Ottoman Turks, and they begin to invade what's left of the Byzantine Empire. They were uh, from, Mon from Mongolia. And uh, anyway, they begin, as they conquered all seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation, were there. They're all wiped out by the invading Muslims. And the Byzantine Emperor cries to the West for help, and uh, the West sends help. It's called the what? 
the Crusades. So Pope Urban II, they send the first crusade, takes back Jerusalem for 100 years, and the rest of them sort of fizzle. But the Crusades saved Europe because it tied the Muslims up on their turf and bought Europe two centuries. Because the Muslims eventually did invade Europe and surrounded Vienna twice, 1529, 1683. Had they done it two centuries earlier, Europe was not organized enough and the Muslims would have conquered it. Anyway, King Richard the Lionheart led the Third Crusade. Remember Robin Hood, that story. And, uh, and then I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. He led the Seventh and Eighth Crusades against the Muslims. And he was King Louis IX. When the Crusades ended, the Muslims continued to advance. In 1300, they had Spain, North Africa, the Zanzibar coast, Madagascar, Indonesia, the Mughals, and uh, all, Bekistan, Kazakhstan, all those areas. And then Tamerlane, a Muslim that was so devout, he had a crown they had to carry around in a wheelbarrow. Uh, he told his men to come back with a head in every hand. He killed 17 million people, wiped out the church in Central Asia. And uh, then when they would capture a Christian city, they'd take the boys and force them to become Muslim soldiers called Janissaries. And if they were pretty, they went into the Muslim pederasty, their homosexual culture. So today you talk to soldiers in Afghanistan, they'll say that Thursday is the man-boy love Thursday, right? And then Friday is their mosque day. Um, and they capture Kosovo. And then in 1450, this is what's left of the Byzantine Empire. A little bit there and there. Now, notice these other colored islands. What are they? Those are Venetian and Genoan merchant states. They were trading and selling goods to the Muslims that they knew were going to be used against the Byzantine defenders, but they didn't care. They just wanted a buck. So here you have Western financial interests betraying the West. Coincidentally, Bloomberg makes a lot of money with his business deals with Arab Muslims, and Bloomberg appointed every member of the real estate board that approved the Ground Zero Mosque. You know, so there's financial interest. Somebody was bribed to leave the gates of Constantinople open. And that's when they finally conquered Constantinople. What was the year? 1453. When Constantinople fell to the Muslims, it ended once and for all the land trade routes between Europe and India and China. And so this is the first century. Marcus Aurelius writes about receiving uh, ambassadors from the Han Dynasty in China. Right? So Europe traded with India and China, but when the Muslims attacked the caravans and trade routes and they finally sacked Constantinople in 1453, the Europeans decided to look for a sea route, and that's when Columbus set sail. And Columbus thought he had made it to India, so he named the inhabitants the Indians. Think of it, we would not call Native Americans Indians over here if it had not been for a jihad over there. That cut off the land routes to India. I'm skipping through a lot of slides, but they're all on the DVD, Islamic Conquest, Past and Present, and in the book, what every American needs to know about the Quran. Um, 1456, Muslims surround Belgrade, and uh, the Pope sends this elderly 70-year-old priest, San Juan Capistrano, and Muslims break through the walls, and he grabs a cross and charges to where they're running in. The people rally, and they drive the Muslims out. Um, but anyway, they're finally driven out of Spain, but they still control. This was the largest empire in the world at the time. And um, then the Reformation starts, and Suleiman the Magnificent surrounds Vienna, Austria, 1529, with 100,000 troops. And Martin Luther uh, says, the Turk is the rod of the wrath of the Lord our God. The Turk's God, the devil, is not beaten first. There's reason to fear the Turk will not be so easy to beat. Fight against the Turk must begin to repent, and so forth. Our great numberless sins and ingratitude have earned God's wrath in his favor, so he justly gives us into the hands of the devil and the Turk. Here's John Cavill. I've heard the sad condition of your Germany. The Turk again prepares to wage war with a larger force. Who will stand up and oppose us marching throughout the length and breadth of the land at his mere pleasure? Anyway, see Gemalta, uh, an island off of Italy that was the last stronghold that the Muslims needed to capture before they could invade Italy and then take over Europe. And the defenders uh, withstood them. And then 1571, the largest battle on the Mediterranean Sea, the Battle of Lepanto. Uh, 230 Muslim ships with 15,000 Christian slaves under the deck like Ben-Hur rowing for the Muslims. And then Don John of Austria, one of the few times the Europeans worked together. And um, 15 minutes before the battle, the wind changed directions and favored the Holy League. And uh, Don John sailed his real into Ali Pasha's ship and they fought and chopped off his head. And uh, 200 of the 230 Muslim ships were defeated. And this was the beginning of the end of the Muslim dominance on the Mediterranean Sea. And um, then Captain John Smith, he spent, he left England in 20 years old, went to fight the Muslims who were invading Hungary. Uh, very successful. You see him with a cross and there's the Muslim crescent. He gets a coat of arms with three Muslim heads with turbans chopped, uh, chopped off. And um, anyway, he's captured, made a slave in Constantinople, escapes to Russia, and then finally makes his way back to England in 1605. And in 1606, he founds Virginia. And if you go to Virginia and you see the statue of John Smith, it says he fought in Turkey and then went to Russia before he founded uh, Jamestown. And then the pilgrims, uh, they, in 1625, fill a ship with 800 pounds of beaver skin, send it back to England. And William Bradford writes that they were in the English Channel when a Turkish man of war captured it, took it to Morocco, and sold the crew into slavery. 
And so the Muslims captured an entire Irish village in 1627, the stolen village of Baltimore, Ireland. Took them to Morocco, sold them into harems and galley slaves. Only two ever made it back to Ireland. 1630, they captured 400 from Reykjavik, Iceland. And so as they were attacking, again, these Catholic orders called the Trinitarians would collect alms and donations and go back, and Jefferson even worked with them. But the Europeans decided to pay an annual tribute to the Muslim pirates, uh, millions of dollars, Sweden, Spain, England. But when America broke from Britain, they said, oh, you're your own country. You've got to pay your own tribute. And so anyway, that was when we began to pay 20% of our federal budget to the Muslim pirates. 1683, the Polish king comes to Vienna's rescue a second time. On September 11, 1683, 200,000 Muslims had surrounded Vienna. Jan Sobieski is led through a pass in the mountains. A little trivia, he charges in, the Muslims flee so fast, he goes into the tents and he finds these, uh, there's the tent, there's Jan Sobieski, goes in the tents, he finds these bags of beans. Coffee beans. And realizes this was this new drink the Muslims had that allowed them to fight day and night. And shortly thereafter, George Franz Kleszowski, this Polish general, opens the first Vienna coffee house. Now, they weren't sure if they should drink it, so they took a cup of it to Pope Clement. He said, this is too good to leave for the Muslims. Let's baptize it. And then coffee spread across Europe. <laughs> now, the word coffee comes from the Arabic word kafir, which means infidel. Because the beans came from Ethiopia, the one country in Africa to stay Christian, and the Muslims call them kafir infidels. And so this was the kafir bean, the infidel bean. Did you get your cup of infidel today? But it's okay to drink. Pope Clement said so. Um, <laughs> now, they were, um, the Muslims were besieging Vienna and tunneling under the walls. A baker was up early, rationing bread, heard the rumbling, told the soldiers they blew it up, that tunnel, and afterwards they were going to reward the baker. And he says, I don't need a reward, just give me the sole permission to cook a pastry in the shape of the Muslim crescent, and it was called a croissant. So the next time you have coffee and croissants, you can celebrate the victory of the Battle of Vienna, September 11, 1683. Anyway, James Oglethorpe, the founder of Georgia, he spent two years fighting the Muslims in Serbia. Uh, here's John Wesley. Ever since the religion of Islam appeared in the world, the espousers of it have been wolves and tigers to all other nations, running and tearing their apart, blah, blah, blah. And so then we see all of North Africa, Morocco, Algiers, Tunisia, so forth, um, was the Barbary Coast. And uh, again, Captain William Bainbridge, we were paying 20% of our federal budget to the day of Algiers. And this is the second war after our revolution, and um, our first war after the revolution. And so Thomas Jefferson is sent as an ambassador to France to try to get back about 300 of our sailors that were captured. He had to meet with this Muslim ambassador, Abdrahman, and uh, he writes to Congress, the ambassador answered us, it was founded on the laws of the prophet written in their Quran, that all nations who should have not acknowledged their Islam's authority were sinners. And it was a right and duty to make war upon them wherever they could be found and make slaves of all they could take as prisoners. And every Muslim who should be slain was sure to go to paradise where you'd have those virgins and so forth. And so this is the Quran that Jefferson bought so he could try to figure out his enemies thinking why they're capturing and killing. And that's the Quran that Keith Ellison swore into Congress upon. And the media said, isn't this great? Jefferson loved Islam too. It's like, well, I think he was fighting a war against them. The Muslims break the treaty and James Madison has to send in our Marines again with Stephen Decatur. Stephen Decatur break, uh, brokers the treaty. And Stephen Decatur writes, Algerians were believed to be masters of duplicity, willing to make agreements and break them as they found convenient. That's the way Muhammad was when he first went as an immigrant to Medina and he made a treaty with the Jews and became a political leader. And then when he got strong and the increase of his followers and he had um, uh, chopped off the heads and he drove the Jews out. And so this idea that when you're weak, you make treaties until you get strong enough to disregard them. Finally, uh, the France and, uh, I'm sorry, England and Holland bombarded Algiers and um, then France took over Algiers and stopped the piracy for a long time. Uh, here's our sixth president, John Quincy Adams. He says, in Islam, treachery and violence are taught as principles of religion. Here's Winston Churchill. said, Islam is a system of ethics which regards treachery and violence as virtues rather than the vices. Now, again, there are lots of moderate Muslims. Moderate Muslims are not trying to imitate Muhammad. They just want to live their life and fine. But there is the fundamental faction that they want to imitate Muhammad religiously, politically, and militarily. So the more fundamentally they follow his example, the more this comes about. Then in the late 1800s, the uh, Ottoman Empire begins to fall apart. Uh, Greece breaks away, uh, parts of Hungary and Wallachia, Moldova break away, and a little country called Armenia wanted to break away from the Muslims too. And uh, the Muslim Sultan, Abdul Hamid, killed 100,000 in 1896. And then the young Turks, three Turkish generals, take over, 
and they decide they have to restore the Ottoman Empire to its former glory, they have to kill all non-Muslims. They kill a million and a half Armenian Christians between 1915 and 1922. Teddy Roosevelt's trying to get us to come to their rescue. We don't. I mean, just a terrible genocide. Um, they would slit open the bellies of the pregnant women, march them into the desert, surround them with machine guns. Uh, a lot of them fled to America, and a lot of them fled to California. And uh, their district, by the way, has a congresswoman named Nancy Pelosi, and she promised them that if they'd vote for her, she'd have our Congress recognize the Armenian Armenian genocide, but I guess uh, dropped the ball on that one. But um, anyway, when Hitler was asked how he could get away with killing the Jews, he said the world did nothing when they killed the Armenians. So what I just showed you was the Turkish wave. So we got the Arabic Persian wave, and then the Turkish wave, and now we're beginning the third wave. After the Ottoman Empire was falling apart, the Muslim world saw the West developing airplanes, telephones, and televisions. And so they wanted to distance themselves from their fundamental past and dress in business suits, get rid of the fezes and the burqas, and teach English in their country, sort of like the Shah of Iran. Remember him? He was so pro-West. I went to college with an Iranian student. He had an American flag on his dorm room wall. I mean, they were so pro-American. But a couple things happened. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood was started in 1928, and it said, don't try to be friends with the West. We're here to conquer the world. And they had their plan as would be two phases. One, the Meccan phase. Now, what happened in Mecca? Well, let's see, Mecca, Muhammad was just a religious leader. So the Muslim Brotherhood's first phase is to just be a religious Muslim and infiltrate all these countries and just build little communities and sleeper cells and get jobs in all kinds of different important positions. January of 2011, the Muslim Brotherhood got new leadership and began to quote from the Medina verses, sending the signal it's time to move to what happened in Medina. That's when Muhammad became a political and a military leader. So all across the Muslim world, there was this political, military overthrowing of their, their secular dictators that were trying to be friends with the West. And whenever you introduce democracy into a Muslim country, it winds up with Sharia law run by the Black Panther Muslim Brotherhood. Anyway, their goal, the Muslim Brotherhood's goal, is to have one world government controlled by a Muslim caliph. And then something else happens. In 1938, West discovers oil in Saudi Arabia, which was the most backwards Muslim country. Egypt was a very high-class Muslim country with 33 dynasties of history of being the ruler of the world. Persia, Cyrus of Persia, and then the Sinassinid Persia, they twice were the largest empire in the world. So Persia and Egypt, you know, ran it. They had this, this culture of being a higher. There was nothing in, um, in Arabia but, but these hot desert sands. But we discovered we pumped billions of dollars into the most backwards Muslim country, and it becomes the richest, and all the other ones become satellites around it. So we're actually provided the magnet. And then uh, Hitler was going to send all the Jews to the Holy Land, and, he, and the Mufti of Jerusalem says, we don't want the Jews, kill them. And so he raised a Panzer, Panzer division of Muslims to fight alongside of Hitler. And then in 1955, they had a pogrom in um, Constantinople, changed the name of the city to Istanbul, and that's when they uh, uh, drove out 50,000 more of these Greek Christians. So, modern Muslims believe the world will submit to Allah later. Fundamentals believe the world's going to submit now. Now, if you were a modern Muslim and thought it was going to happen in the future, what would you think if uh, you saw these things? Nancy Pelosi submitting to Islamic law in Syria, and Laura Bush did the same thing, and Hillary Clinton did the same thing, and now our women in our military have to wear veils. Do you believe that? And uh, we issue Islamic postage stamps in a Muslim Miss America, and we got Muslims swearing upon a Quran. And we have um, President Bush was the first president to speak in a mosque. Why? Well, it's just a political constituency. Speak at a union hall, get union votes, senior senate, get senior votes, mosque, get Muslim votes. He doesn't think that they have their own agenda, but there's 1,400 years of it. He celebrates Ramadan in the White House twice. The current president did three times, put a crown in the presidential library, appointed a Muslim as the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. The current president's bowing to King Abdullah. The two holiest spots in Islam are in Arabia, Mecca and Medina. So bowing to the king of Arabia is sort of like kissing the godfather's ring. It has tremendous symbolic significance. And here he is uh, saying, whatever he wants, we're no longer a Christian nation. Here's his half-brother, Malik Obama, who is a Muslim in Kenya with four wives. And here he's campaigning for him. And anyway, don't got time to go through it all. Here he is, Barry Sitaro, Honolulu's religion, Islam. And he talks about uh, saying the prayers when he was there uh, up till 10 years old. Uh, again, Muslims bowing toward Mecca. When it's an RPM, it's a religious system, a political system, and a military system. Uh, so bowing is a religious, political, military pledging of allegiance. It's impossible to split them because Muhammad was all three. And women are at the back of the room. Because Muhammad said, if a dog, a donkey, or a woman passes between you and Mecca, your prayers are invalidated. Anyway, 3,000 Muslims praying on a U.S. Capitol on. What would you think if there were 3,000 people having a Billy Graham crusade in downtown Mecca? I mean, this is very enthusiastic it, it's to them. And then we're appointing Muslims to uh, key positions in homeland security. This guy, Arif Alakan, was uh, deputy mayor of Los Angeles and stopped Los Angeles from tracking terrorists. Did such a good job. He's chosen to be a member of homeland security. Kareem Shora from uh, uh, Damascus. And then uh, Rashad Hussein. 
He said, the president's educator in chief to America on Islam. And here's Dahlia Magahed, first veiled Muslim woman uh, appointed by the president. She said, Sharia law is misunderstood as gender justice. So ladies, if you want to, where you, you can't leave your house without a male relative, and you can't wear the, leave the house without wearing a burqa, or, or, and if you get raped, it's your fault. Anyway, um, head of NASA says, forget the moon and the space shuttle. Uh, Obama wants me to find a way to reach out to the Muslim world and so forth. Uh, Hillary Clinton's using this money to rebuild mosques. Um, and uh, Colin Powell, Obama's Muslim heritage feeds a broader suspicion. He's too casual about threats from America's Islamist enemies. And then there's this guy who says, do jihad through money? Prince Al Walid bin Talal, and uh, he's donating money to Harvard and Georgetown, and he bought a, uh, an interest in Fox News, by the way. And uh, so whenever Muslims conquer cities, they take the most prominent spot and build the mosque. So they conquered Mecca, turned Kapa into a mosque. Temple Mount in Jerusalem turned into a mosque. St. John's Church in Damascus, uh, Cave of the Patriarchs, where Abraham's buried, into a mosque. Conquer Constantinople, turned the Hagia Sophia into a mosque. Anyway, you get the picture. And so Islam's just a religion. It, there's three words, three meanings to one word, the word light. Light is a, uh, it's a noun, like a source of illumination. It's an adjective, like a, a light is a feather. And it's a verb, like you're going to light a fire. So the word light, spelled L-I-G-H-T, is three, three things, a noun, an adjective, and a verb. Islam is one word with three meanings. It's a religious system, political system, and a military system. And uh, so, because Muhammad was all three. So the religion of Islam is okay, but when it begins to want to change the laws, then it's not okay, because they have no concept of equality. And our whole country is based on equality. So if the Bloods and Crips take over a neighborhood, should they be allowed uh, to come in as immigrants and uh, do their vigilante gang, gang land killings with pimps and prostitutes? If the KKK takes over a neighborhood, should they be able to burn crosses and, and do lynchings? If the mafia takes over a neighborhood, should they be able to, you know, knock off people? Well, if Muslims take over neighbors, should they be allowed to have their Sharia law where a guy can have four wives and if you leave Islam, you get killed as an apostate? No. So when they want to change the laws, we, we don't allow that. And here's a guy that wants to change the laws, Joram Qadari. Uh, he immigrated to England. We request all Muslims in the United Kingdom to join and declare as submitters to Almighty Allah. We've had enough of democracy and man-made law. We call for a comp complete upheaval of the British ruling system full implementation of Sharia in Britain. So these immigrants that are coming in are not just content with taking advantage and living off of the welfare system. They want to change the laws. And so there's a, there's a faction of the immigrants from the Islamic world, not all of them. There's always, been moderate ones, excuse me, there's always been moderate ones throughout history, and they just basically stay at home and have kids. But it's the fundamental ones that have been doing all the conquering. And so there is a percentage that are fundamental that do have this agenda. And I'll just end with this last um, thought. Um, if we take the religion of Islam and set it on a shelf and just examine political militant Islam, it has two qualities, global conquest and, number two, wherever it conquests and takes over, non-Muslims are not treated with equality. So here's a question for you. In the last 70 years, what political military systems has America had to face that, one, had a global conquest aspect to them, and two, wherever they took over, non-adherents were not equal? Any ideas? Communism, what else? Nazi I mean, I'm half German, but in the 1930s, America said, look, we love the German, but we have to identify and stand against this political military system of Nazism. Why? It has a global conquest aspect to it, and two, wherever it takes over, non-Nazis like Jews are not equal. And we love the Japanese, but we had to identify and stand against Emperor Hirohito's imperialism. Why? He killed 100,000 in Nanking, China, took over Korea and the Philippines. And we love the Italian, but we had to stand against Mussolini's fascism. And we love the Russian, but we had to stand against Soviet communism. Why? It has a global conquest aspect to it, and two wherever it takes over, non-communists are not equal. Well, today we love the Arab, we love the Indonesian, we love the Turk, the Egyptian, the Pakistani, but we have to identify and stand against political and military Islam. Why? It has a global conquest aspect to it, and two wherever it takes over, non-Muslims are not treated with equality. So, anyway, I could go on and on, but uh, you sort of get a picture there, and uh, you know, there's Sharia law that's being practiced uh, in places around the world today. And uh, unfortunately, it's a reality. We can try to ignore it, um, but uh, we do it to our own peril and our, our future kids. So, anyway, uh, is that is that good? <laughs> now there. Uh, yeah. The the question is, uh, are groups in America facilitating? Yeah. The the drive neutral reverse concepts so of the secularism is facilitating multiculturalism is the AIDS virus of Western civilization. Did you catch that? Multiculturalism is the AIDS virus of Western civilization. There's more freedom and opportunity in America than any other country in all 6,000 years of world history. We've got something special here that we want to pass to our kids. There's four reasons why people allow the agenda to advance. One is they're totally ignorant, and I've spoken to a lot of congressmen that don't have a clue, and they just think that they're just another constituency that I want votes from. So one, they're totally ignorant. Two, they're afraid. 
They don't want people threatening them. They don't want people demonstrating, you know, they don't want people put written up in the news that they're intolerant. So one, they're um, ignorant. Two, they're afraid. Three, they're on the take, right? I mean, they're getting some, I mean, Jimmy Carter was, his library was going bankrupt and some distant cousin of Osama bin Laden gives him $7 million. He comes out with a book saying, oh, give the Palestinian terrorists a chance. I mean, you know, money can change. So, so one, you're ignorant. Two, you're afraid. Three, you're on the take. And four, you want the agenda and you're secretly wanting to promote it. I, I've, I have with Muslims in the audience, and, the, and sometimes they'll stand up and they'll say, oh, well, you're not quoting Muhammad right or whatever, and get huffy puffy and people will shot and they'll leave. Um, but, um, you know, there's taqiyya, it's sacred lying, holy deceit. It's, now, there are moderate Muslims, and I've met moderate Muslims, and most of them don't know their own history. Most of them don't know the Quran. Most of them say, oh, we never read the Quran growing up. So we just, whatever my mom said this, and my, you know. Um, but there are fundamental ones, and they are a faction that does exist, and they have a political agenda. And that's the brilliance of the strategy. They can take advantage of the freedom of religion to have a political change. When you compare religions, and you say, okay, there are lots of violent ones, let's go, if your computer acts up, what do you do? You go back to the way it was when you bought it from the, from the store. Right? And if it really acts up, you reload the software. So let's go back to the beginning and compare Jesus with Muhammad. Jesus never killed anybody. Muhammad killed an estimated 3,000 people. Jesus never owned slaves. Muhammad got a fifth of the slaves taken in battle. Jesus never married. Muhammad had anywhere from 11 to 22 wives. Jesus never forced anybody to follow him. Muhammad said, whoever changes his Islamic religion, kill him. Jesus never tortured anybody. When Muhammad conquered Kaibar, he stretched the Jewish chief out on the ground and kindled a fire on his chest and uh, built, and so he still wouldn't tell he had him beheaded. And so you go back and compare the founders. A backslidden Christian will be violent, but a fundamental Muslim is the one following Muhammad's example. That's the dilemma. You know, they, they, they killed Jews in Europe. That's terrible. That was a, a horrible crime that we repent of. I mean, we wiped out Indian tribes, and we repent of that today. There's never been an abolitionist movement in Islam. They've never said, we're sorry that we enslaved, you know, millions of people.